Hello again, this is TOK Exhibition Sample 2 from Semantic Education and um, that's the plan of this video that I'm going to walk you through. A quick reminder for the TOK Exhibition and the new TOK course, students are required to do the following. They need to select three real-world objects, they need to link them to one of the 35 knowledge questions given in the guide, they need to create a written commentary of up to 950 words about all these three objects in total and the commentary for each of the objects must include uh, according to the criteria three things uh, there needs to be an identification of the object and its specific real-world context there needs to be an explanation of the link between the object and the IA prompt and there needs to be a justification for the inclusion of the object of the object in the exhibition uh, there's a better uh, concise re concise introduction into the nature of requirements of the TOK exhibition that we made earlier in the form of an animated video. Please do check it out on our channel. Um, in the previous video I already created the first TOK exhibition sample and the whole idea is that I'm trying to demonstrate not just the final product but the whole thinking process that goes into it uh, because the IB gives you a clear set of requirements for the final product, but uh, the problem is it's not entirely clear how to, to get to that destination where you have an awesome uh, TOK exhibition. In the first video, I started with a prompt and I tried thinking about the prompt on an abstract level and I worked my way down to the specific objects and I called this the top-down process. You can see the three objects that I selected for my first exhibition sample in that video. If you haven't seen it, please see it. Uh, in this video, I'm going to try a different approach to creating a TOK exhibition. I'll call it a bottom-up approach. Instead of starting with the knowledge question, I will actually start with selecting an object, and then I will try to find a prompt that best fits into the object. Uh, there will be more videos where I will be trying even more different approaches to creating TOK exhibitions. Stay tuned. So, uh, some starting points. Uh, obviously, because this time I want to start with finding an object and then selecting the most suitable IA prompt for the object. The key problem for me is how do I select the first object? Where do I even start? So one thing I remember from the uh, TOK requirements is that the object has to be something specific. It needs to be embedded in a specific real-life context and the IB is quite strict about that. Apparently it can't be a generic object like a teddy bear is not okay but a particular teddy bear that I used to have as a child and that it grew emotionally attached to is better. So how do I select the first object then? Uh, to demonstrate my thinking process, this is what happened. First, I started just looking around myself and noticing a lot of things that um, uh, might work for my exhibition, and none of them worked. I dismissed a lot of ideas. I spent about a day think of just looking around myself and trying to see and notice various objects and trying to think if I could use those objects in a TOK exhibition potentially, and a lot of things didn't work. For example, I was just looking through my daughter's toys. My daughter is three years old currently. And some toys are actually quite interesting. Some, some toys are bizarre. And um, you would think you could, you could spend uh, quite some time discussing why these toys are so bizarre, what kind of thinking went into them. But at the same time, toys are generic mass-produced objects and there's not really much context around them. I also looked uh, at stuff like, I actually googled most bizarre things uh, just to expose myself to more things. I found lots of lists, lists of very popular on the internet, like 15 most bizarre things you could find on Amazon, for example. A lot of such lists contain items that you can buy, so consumer items. Some of them are kind of great, they're quite thought-provoking, for example, I saw a device that fixes your coffee cup to a handrail on the subway train. I actually contemplated, contemplated basing my exhibition on an object like that. Or uh, an umbrella hat. But again, I kind of struggled connecting these mass-produced objects, mass-produced consumer objects to the concept of knowledge. So I had to dismiss these ideas as well. 
Um, I kept thinking, I remember this recommendation made in the guide to um, base your exhibition on one of the themes. So I thought maybe my uh, field of search is too wide, so I can just as well narrow it down. I randomly picked knowledge and technology and I decided to focus my search for an object in this area. And that prompted me to look for something interesting or unusual in some inventions. So I thought I'm looking for a thing that's connected with technology, so it's probably some sort of invention. So I started googling most bizarre inventions and similar uh, search queries. And I found more lists, essentially, none of them worked. But I was, as I was browsing through these lists, I suddenly stumbled upon inventions for baby care. And then I suddenly remembered something. I read about some weird baby beds that used to be, uh, that, that, that were in circulation in the past. I, I actually already had that knowledge in my background. It was just not active in my memory. So it just didn't occur to me that I could use that. Uh, the knowledge of mine when creating a TOK exhibition, but uh, this kind of random search uh, prompted me to think about it again. So I started googling history of cribs to refresh my memory, and then I found a fascinating story about baby cages. Baby cages were actually not the products I had in mind, but as I was reading about history of cribs, they attracted my attention. Um, and that's it. I decided to use baby cage, uh, baby cage as my first object. I found several, I'm going to tell you uh, in the next slide what a baby cage is, it's quite fascinating. Uh, just a disclaimer, I found several old pictures of a baby cage with an actual baby in it. But all these pictures, I couldn't use them in this video because they're all copyrighted. Uh, obviously this won't be a problem for you because in a TOK exhibition you don't have to worry about that as long as you uh, cite your sources. Um, but instead, I found the, the next best thing. Uh, I found a picture from one of the first patents of a baby cage. All patents by US law are in public domain, so uh, images from patents can be freely used. Um, let me tell you about what a baby cage is then. Uh, a baby cage, or also called a window crib, is essentially a crib that is designed to be suspended outside the window so that your child sleeps outside, literally. You just put the crib outside the window and close your window and the child will be just hanging outside of your flat. Uh, these cribs became popular at the start of the 20th century after a certain Dr. Luther Emmett Holt popularized in his books, popularized the idea of airing babies, that is allowing babies to sleep outside in fresh air, even in cold temperatures. According to him, exposing babies to fresh air outside systematically produces lots of beneficial effects for their health, uh, both physical health and mental health and general stamina. So he widely advocated for airing babies, ventilating babies. Reportedly, according to some articles that I read recently, even Eleanor Roosevelt used the baby cage for her child Anna and it ended badly because her neighbors saw that and they threatened to call the authorities on her um, for child abuse or something like that. So as you can see, it was not always widely accepted. But the ideas became a bit more popular by the start of the 20th century and people wanted to find solutions. Not everyone has a garden, uh, so people living in, in um, city flats were, were looking for a solution and that was the age when the first patents appeared, such as Emma Reed's patent of a portable baby cage. Uh, the picture that you see in, in the, on the slide is actually from that fairy patent. Uh, as I said, I didn't include an actual old photograph of a baby cage uh, in this video because they're all copyrighted. You could do that in your TOK exhibition. There are some links to articles containing these images in the description below this video, so please feel free to check them out and see the baby cage in action, so to speak. Um, so that's it. That's my first object. I kind of like it. I thought it w there's something in it. It will do. Um, it's interesting. It has context. Uh, it's unusual. Uh, I will use it as, as the first object in my TOK exhibition. So now I need to look for the suitable prompt. 
uh, with my bottom-up approach. I start looking at the list of 35 prompts to see if the baby cage links nicely to any of them. And it feels like the best candidate is this one. It's one of the last prompts on the list. In what ways do values affect the production of knowledge? I rack my brain a little and I think maybe I can argue that sometimes our values prevent us from producing potentially useful knowledge. Like, you know, airing um, the claim that airing babies leads to a lot of uh, beneficial effects on their health is a big claim. It needs to be tested, researched. Um, and we will never know unless we try with, with, with some number of babies. But if we don't try, because we feel like it's not acceptable practice to place your baby outside, like suspend the baby outside the window, then we will never know. Maybe something along those lines. Uh, I know that the use of baby cages was discontinued quite quickly. Um, interestingly, uh, they were used the longest in London, but in New York, for example, they were discontinued almost immediately. So inventions like this and research in that area was not a frequent occurrence at that time, probably because people did not feel too well about placing those, their babies outside in this manner. So it kind of illustrates the idea that our values, such as caring about our babies, can sometimes prevent potentially useful knowledge from being gained. And I feel like it's kind of interesting, it's an interesting twist, so why don't I keep that as my link to the prompt? So decided then, I will use that as my uh, IA prompt and I will use a baby cage as my first object. So the first object will be an image from Emma Reed's patent of a portable baby cage. Uh, or, if I was not bound by copyright issues, I would have used one of the old photographs of the actual baby cage. Uh, the context is that these baby cages were suggested as a way to keep babies healthy by airing them, but this practice was quickly discontinued due to some hard feelings produced in a lot of parents. Um, how am I going to explain the link to the IA prompt? In what ways do values affect the production of knowledge? Well, I can say that values can prevent us from gaining potentially useful knowledge before baby cages could become popular and before we could understand if airing babies enhances their health, the use of baby cages was already discontinued, so we never got to know. How am I going to justify the inclusion of the object in my exhibition? Well, my object shows that values sometimes create an obstacle to obtaining knowledge that is potentially useful. All right, uh, now over to the second object. Uh, I have the first one, I need to select the second one. How do I do that? Um, I remember about the recommendation, uh, Maze in the TOK Guide, to base the exhibition on one of the themes. I'm not worrying about this too much now, even if my second object is not based on one of those, uh, uh, on the same theme as my first object. It's not going to be a big problem. I don't want to limit myself in that way. But I could still try looking for another example of technology just to kind of give myself a sense of direction. So having that in mind, I start thinking, well, there's another, another requirement that I have to meet. I will need to justify the inclusion of my second object uh, into the exhibition. So my second object, in terms of the message that it sends to the visitor of my exhibition, needs to add something new to what I have already said. And I have said that sometimes values can prevent us from obtaining potentially useful knowledge. So what else can I say about the um, role of values in knowledge production? Um, I feel like what I have said with the first object is a bit one-sided. It's not like values always prevent us from obtaining knowledge. I can also argue that values drive our knowledge in a way they motivate us to pursue things. So maybe I should try finding an object, like an example of technology, some sort of invention, that captures the idea that values can drive um, the production of knowledge, can drive innovation. So with these things in mind, I start thinking, what do we humans care about? And how does, how does it motivate our knowledge or research? Because what's a value? A value is something that we humans attach subjective importance to. So what, what do we attach subjective importance to? What do we care about? 
And from there, my thinking leads me to thinking about war, because I realize that the most progressive inventions in human history have been made in the name of war. Our best innovations come from the desire to be better than our enemy, to essentially to better others at killing, and to protecting ourselves. So I'm thinking maybe I can find an object that represents some crazy military innovation that was way ahead of its time. And I can argue that, that there we go, some values of survival and being better than our enemy enabled us to um, fast track the production of knowledge in certain uh, war-related areas. And these were amazing innovations that were very much ahead of their time. Now I feel like I'm on the right track, so I start looking for, um, for, for what I said. Essentially, I start googling weapon innovations that changed history. And that, that brings me a lot of lists, so now I feel like I just need to pick one, really. And I remember that it needs to be something with uh, specific real-life context, so I'm just looking for an uh, innovation in weaponry that has a specific real-life context that is easy to explain. And I end up picking the Atlatl, I'm hoping I pronounced correctly. An Atlatl is a spear-throwing device. I read an article explaining how this simple device has made a huge difference in the life of early humans. It was a genius invention that helped our civilization to become what it has become, essentially. It's just uh, essentially just a stick that allows you to throw your spear a little bit, a little bit farther. Uh, but it was a, it was a game-changing invention in the history of our species. Uh, that was in one of the atlatls. Um, uh, excavated look like. Essentially it's a stick carved out of wood, a bone. Uh, the oldest one that has been discovered was made in France around 17 and a half thousand years ago. It's pretty impressive. Uh, the way it works is you grab the handle and you place your spear on, on top of the device and then with a swift motion you just uh, throw the spear with, a, with the atlatl essentially. It gives you a bit of extra leverage, so because of that you can throw the spear a little bit farther and it means that you can attack dangerous game animals from a long distance without approaching them uh, too closely and endangering yourself. So we can now hunt big animals like mammoths without endangering ourselves too much. And that changed history for our species apparently. But if you look at this kind of, um, uh, of an invention and if you think that this was invented 17.5, uh, 17 and a half thousand years ago. It's pretty impressive what primitive people of that time were able uh, to achieve in terms of knowledge production and inventing new ways of hunting. And it's, it's probably true that the best innovations of that time were all related to, to being able to kill animals better. So for my second object, I'm going to use the atlatl. Uh, I'm going to say that it's a highly innovative device for throwing spears. It was invented seven, 17 and a half thousand years ago. It was game changing in hunting and survival in general for early humans. How am I going to link it to the IA prompt? Well, I will explain that values may determine what knowledge we choose to seek. That survival was the main value of primitive people. That's what the, we attached subjective importance to. Surviving, eating. So it essentially drove their um, knowledge efforts, their research, if you will, and the most innovative tools were the ones designed to kill. That's not only true for primitive people, I feel like, it's also true for uh, the whole history of humanity on the whole. How am I going to justify the inclusion of my object in the exhibition? Well, my first object showed that values may be an obstacle, and with my second object, I kind of argue that they can also be a motivating factor or a driving force of obtaining knowledge. They can determine which um, fields we are willing to pursue, which fields we're willing to investigate and put our effort in. All right, it seems promising at this point, but I need the third object. So I stop and think, and I'm thinking, what's missing? So far, I have said that values, uh, values may sometimes be an obstacle for obtaining knowledge, and I have also said that in other circumstances they may be a driving force. <clears throat> um, again, I remember that I will have to 
justify the inclusion of my object in the exhibition. So my third object needs to add something new to the idea that my exhibition already conveys. For that reason, I'm thinking apart from these two effects, I should try to think of any other way in which values may affect knowledge. I keep racking my brain and one idea comes to mind. Again, summarizing what I've already said. Values can be an obstacle, values can be a driving force. What else can I say? And I realized that, um, so in the first two points, I said that values can be an obstacle in pr producing knowledge, or values can be a driving force in determining which knowledge will be produced. But I also realized that even when knowledge is already produced, it is there, so we have some data. Values may determine the way I perceive that knowledge or the way I see the data. So maybe values can also be seen as a filter through which we perceive knowledge or something along those lines. I want to argue that even when certain facts are already obtained, our values may determine the way we see the facts and that the same facts may be seen differently if values are different. Uh, so I just need to find an object that illustrates this kind of idea. I want to argue about that because it, it seems like a good connection to the IA prompt that will complement my other two um, links nicely. So uh, weirdly enough, I now have the connection to the IA prompt, but I don't have an object yet. So I start looking for something that would convey that, uh, that thought. And suddenly an idea occurs to me, an example comes to my mind. I remember from my previous knowledge that there's this thing in psychology called projective tests. The most famous one of these is Rorschach's ink blot test. I'm sure you've heard about it. The idea behind those tests is that they give you a vague unstructured stimulus and different people see different things in that, in that ink blot. And the idea is that the reason they see different things in the ink blot is because they have different personalities and different internal conflicts that are torturing them. So they see what they want to see. They see what they are predisposed to see. I do a little bit more reading on the internet. I find the original Rorschach's ink blot test. It consisted of 10 cards. And I decide to settle on one card just to make this example a bit more specific. It's card four uh, from his original 10 card ink blot test. I read a little bit about how this card is interpreted. And um, that's a quotation from a website dedicated to Rorschach. The card is often perceived as being associated with a male figure, which is why the card is often called the father card. I also remember reading in, uh, previously some research associated with using this card in diagnosing various things, including things like male homosexuality. Uh, I remember reading in Chapman and Chapman 1969 for my psychology course that uh, it was shown that male homosexuals more frequently than other people uh, give certain responses when they see this card. Namely, they more frequently see a, a, a contorted or threatening human or animal. For example, they give such responses as a horrid beast or a giant with shrunken arms. Um, if you see a giant with shrunken arms here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have homosexual uh, inclinations, but uh, it is apparently true that statistically speaking uh, responses like a giant with shrunken arms are more prevalent in groups of uh, homosexual subjects as compared to heterosexual subjects. But for my reasons, for, for, for the purposes of TOK exhibition, what's important is that different people see the same ink blot, but they report seeing different things, because presumably uh, the uh, different people have uh, associate, uh, attach subjective importance to different details and different aspects of their lives. There we go. My third object will be Rorschach's ink blot test, uh, created in 1921, card 4. Uh, Rorschach noticed that different people project different meanings onto the blots. He hypothesized that this reflects their deep conflicts or their core values, and he was using uh, that to diagnose the conflicts and values of his patients. How am I going to explain the link to the prompt? Well, as I said, when two people have different sets of values, they are likely to see different things even when they are exposed to the same data. 
uh, it probably doesn't only apply to uh, separate individuals, it probably applies to societies or even time periods or paradigms. Uh, how am I going to justify why I have included this object in my exhibition? Well, it adds very nicely to the two uh, points that I made with my two pr previous two objects. Uh, I have said with my first object that values may be an obstacle. I have said with my second object that values may be a driving force for the production of knowledge. And I seem to be saying with my third object that even when knowledge is already produced, values may decide what we make of it. Uh, let's look back at the entire exhibition. So that's the overview of all the three objects that I have. Uh, importantly, they're all in uh, public domain, so I don't need to cite my sources here because it's allowed to present them without citations. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's important to cite the sources in your TOK exhibition because likely you will use some copyrighted material. Uh, to look back at the thinking process that I have, I have been using here, I was trying to approach this exhibition uh, in a bottom-up kind of way. So I started um, with choosing an object and then uh, thinking about the IA prompt that will be most suitable for them. However, you would have noticed that this logic only actually worked in the beginning when I was choosing my first object, the, the window crib, the baby cage. And after that, after I had my first object, uh, I kind of switched back to top-down approach again because um, I first thought about what kind of idea I would like to add to my exhibition on the abstract level and then I was selecting a trying to find an object to illustrate or exemplify that idea. I feel now after doing this exercise that the top-down approach will be kind of inevitable at some point and the difference between bottom-up and top-down will actually lie mostly in the selection of the first object, maybe the first two objects. But at some point, because you need to justify the inclusion of your objects in your exhibition, you will uh, probably have to switch to, to abstract thinking first and then try, trying to find objects that better support your abstract reasoning. Um, obviously, another thing I'm, I'm thinking about, it will be very important to write the explanations in the actual commentary in a very concise and clear way. For example, uh, a lot will depend on how exactly the links between the objects and the prompts are articulated. And for this you need to be comfortable with uh, the concepts such as values or production of knowledge. In my exploration I also um, I have brought up other concepts as well such as interpretation, progress, innovation, data, usefulness of knowledge. All these things are TOK concepts and TOK examiners obviously will be looking at your commentary and making a judgment about how comfortably and how uh, appropriately you are using these TOK concepts. Thankfully we have this awesome new TOK textbook that explains concepts really well. Not only um, uh, does it teach you uh, concepts in every lesson, it teaches you how to approach concepts you have never encountered before. Uh, in a way that will allow you to understand them deeply and systematically. Um, let's go over to marking them. So the exhibition is created. Uh, let's mark it. Um, as usual, I'm thinking what could potentially go wrong. I was trying to do a good job. I think I managed to do a decent job. But I'm trying to foresee what criticisms I can potentially expect from examiners. For example, could it be that examiners might say that the context behind my objects is not specific enough? Or could they say that my objects are not linked well enough to the prompt? Or could they say that the inclusion of my objects in the exhibition is not justified well enough? Or could they say that my exhibition is not based on one of the themes? So I'm going to try and address these four points one by one. In terms of real-life context, could it be that the context behind my objects is not specific enough? The IB seems to be very, um, very strict and adamant about uh, the objects having some specific real-life context. Um, I thought about it and I think I don't know how to make my objects more specific. If you take a baby cage, yes, it was a mass-produced object at that time, but still it has a very specific context to it that I have explained in this video. If I wanted to make it even more specific than that, I could have said 
This is Eleanor Roosevelt's baby cage, but I don't think this move would be necessary. It's not adding anything to my argument in terms of how the baby cage connects to the IA prompt. So I feel like um, my context are coming through pretty nicely for all three objects. And actually, when I was doing that, I found it quite challenging to describe the context behind the three objects briefly. Uh, the first version of this presentation was actually uh, quite a bit longer than what you're currently seeing because I had to cut a bit of context uh, out of my explanations. So that suggests that there seems to be enough context behind my objects. And my challenge is not to spend too many words on it, not to waste the word count. Uh, let me know if you think differently. Now, in terms of linking to the prompt, can they say that my objects are not linked well enough to the prompt? Well, I have tried to explain it uh, to explain it as much as possible. Obviously, a lot will depend on how I actually articulate this in the actual written commentary. But I have explained, for example, that production of knowledge may be impaired if certain ideas are not deemed acceptable. So I linked the uh, baby cage, for instance, to production of knowledge by saying that we could gain new knowledge and new information about the effects of airing on baby development. But we didn't because we felt bad about placing babies outside like that. So we never kind of this prevented us from getting knowledge that could potentially be useful. Uh, and in that sense, values, the subjective importance were attached to babies, prevented us from, from, from producing some knowledge. Mostly I have also managed to talk about the production of knowledge. The IA prompt talks about production of knowledge. And I also talk about production of knowledge, producing knowledge of effects of airing on babies, producing new ways to kill mammoths, producing subjective interpretations of the same data and our knowledge of some, somebody's personality based on those subjective interpretations. I have also linked to the term value. I have defined values broadly uh, in my uh, exhibition, like I have defined it implicitly, but I may define it more explicitly in the actual written commentary. I defined it, I seem to have defined values as anything that we humans attach subjective importance to. Uh, Obviously, I should be explicit in my written commentary itself, and I should explain straight away how I understand these terms so that the examiner understands that I'm quite clear in terms of connections between the objects and the IA prompt. But am I allowed to have my own understanding of concepts? I think I am. I'm perfectly allowed to do that. I'm not supposed to take the, the definition of value from a textbook or from a dictionary and stick to that. I can figure out my own definition. The most important thing is that um, I am consistent with what I define as a, a value, and I am consistent with what I define as a production of as production of knowledge, and I am explicit in showing that my objects link to uh, the to the prompt the way I understand it. Um, again, I think um, I did a decent job linking objects to the to the prompt, but let me know if you think otherwise, because I'm interested in finding potential drawbacks or, uh, or traps or pitfalls here. Um, thirdly, uh, could examiners say that the inclusion of my objects in the exhibition is not justified well enough? Well, as in, as in the first video, uh, I took the approach of justifying the inclusion to explain what unique contribution each of the objects makes. So for me, the inclusion of an, of an object in the exhibition is justified if my second object does not repeat the same does not convey the same idea that my first object has already conveyed. And in this sense, my three objects illustrate the IA prompt more holistically because they, they bring out different aspects, different dimensions of it. So I think uh, I tried to be quite explicit in uh, making sure that it happens. My baby cage, not my baby cage, but the, the image of the baby cage demonstrates that our values, such as all babies are important, can create an obstacle for the production of knowledge, uh, such as what are the effects of airing on baby development. The atlatl, the spear thrower, demonstrates that our values, such as survival, killing for food, um, just kind of living, may be a driving force in the production of knowledge because they challenged us to invent new ways to hunt, 
which were very revolutionary for their time. And the ink blot demonstrates that our values, such as motivations, internal conflicts and areas of focus, influence the way we interpret data. And even if when two people see the same data, their interpretation of the same data set may be different. So the three objects seem to highlight three different ways in which values may influence knowledge, and that seems to be what the prompt is asking for. And that's how I have justified the inclusion of these three objects in my exhibition. So I think I'm fine. Once again, if you think otherwise, let me know. Finally, themes. Uh, can they say that my exhibition is not based on one of the themes? I brought this up in the first uh, exhibition sample already, and I'm bringing this up again. As you know, the IB strongly recommends basing the exhibition on one of the themes, but um, in, in both the instances of creating a, t a sample TOK exhibition, I found it pretty difficult to stick to this recommendation. I actually found it more limiting than empowering in my first uh, exhibition sample. In this exhibition sample, I made a conscious effort to follow this recommendation. And that's why in selecting the first object, I actually focused on a theme to narrow down the choice. That was done for my convenience. I feel like it has helped because when I was just randomly looking for an object to use and looking at all those lists that I found online, uh, it was a bit overwhelming. But once I decided I will be looking at something in knowledge and technology, that brought me to the idea of looking at invent uh, bizarre inventions of the past. And from there, it was quite a straight path. So it allowed me to narrow down on one object uh, conveniently. In selecting the second object, I also told myself to look for another piece of technology. I knew that I didn't have to. It's a strong recommendation, but it's not a requirement. And you don't have to explain how your object is linked to a theme in the actual written commentary. But I chose to do so for convenience. Uh, when I found the... Um, the um, image of the atlatl, the spear thrower, it, it could be categorized as knowledge and technology, but maybe also as knowledge in indigenous societies. Uh, I don't really know, it's kind of ambiguous, but it doesn't matter in the long run. Maybe it is knowledge and technology after all. But in, the, in my choice of third object, I was no longer bothered about connecting it to a theme, because for me, the, the leading, um, my leading motivation was to select an object in such a way that will allow me to justify its inclusion in the exhibition most efficiently. So I was thinking about the message that I'm trying to convey. And that's a lot more important to me than making sure that my third object also comes from knowledge and technology. So it doesn't. The ink blot is probably not, it doesn't probably belong to knowledge and technology. I would place it under knowledge and the knower. But again, uh, I don't think it actually really matters because there's no requirement to explicitly explain the link to one of the themes in the commentary. So this link is not assessed. A link to a theme helped me with uh, narrowing down the choice of my first object, but that's where its function ended. And I feel like that's how we should approach this strong recommendation of the IB. Um, in conclusion, I invite you to give my exhibition a mark and to justify the mark. Uh, argue with my reasoning. If you think uh, I provided some arguments along the way, if you think otherwise, let me know your reasons because I'm genuinely interested in them. I'm interested in your opinions because we're all currently in the same boat. It's a new syllabus, so we will spend some time trying to decipher the IB assessment criteria and trying to uh, understand how exactly the new TOK syllabus actually translates into practice. Uh, watch out for the next videos and thank you for watching. See you next time.